Uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, I first want to thank the organizers for inviting me here to this interesting uh, event. Um, so um, yeah, I will speak about uh, this morning, I will speak about diffusion, um, some aspects of diffusion in some very simple systems, uh, integrable, supposedly integrable systems on a lattice. I should apologize for, for not being uh, uh, along the mainstream of the topic of the conference. So there will be some links to simple systems, there will be some links to quantum systems, but uh, the main point of my talk is not, uh, uh, in a sense, few body system, but it's a many body system. So, uh, so I, I apologize for going to many body physics, but uh, still uh, to have link with simple, I will interpret uh, simple as integrable. And uh, okay, so as I already said, I, I, I'll try to stay on the lattice for, for all my, of my talk. But I will not necessarily stay on quantum lattice, so I will sometimes, uh, at the end of the talk, also go to completely classical lattices, because I argue that the aspects of diffusion are not so quantum, so uh, you could understand them even in the classical systems. Um, and OK, but uh, there will be some aspects of manipulating transport in my talk. I'll try to uh, uh, present some examples of, 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, systems, of models for which where you can turn a knob and uh, switch uh, 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 the nature of transport in the same model from ballistic diffusive uh, via anomalous uh, diffusive transport. Uh, and uh, most of all, I mean, the, the fundamental <coughs> question that uh, I'd like to kind of uh, I, I will not present any sort of understanding of this question, maybe just some, some brief uh, ideas of how might uh, uh, how one might understood at the end uh, some aspects of diffusion so uh, the idea but the big idea is somehow to understand uh, basically the the, the, the the mechanism of diffusion in integrable systems <coughs> so there are a couple of aspects of uh, 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 transport in Hamiltonian conservative systems which I will uh, uh, use in my talk I mean I'm not saying this is the the whole story but at least there are three different three quite different aspects of transport uh, perspectives on which, from which you can uh, 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 um, um, approach transport in Hamiltonian systems. So what I have in mind here is essentially, I mean, this, this, this I have to stress. So I have in mind Hamiltonian conservative systems. So there is no, basically, no stochastic. I mean, to me, this is kind of the opposite to stochastic. Yeah? So the Hamiltonian is basically uh, uh, deterministic dynamics, even though it can be quantum, but uh, uh, there is no, basically, no measurement processes, no, no stochastic elements in the bulk of the system. There could be stochastic elements of the boundaries, as I will argue later, but th there's nothing stochastic, nothing uh, which breaks unitarity or breaks uh, Hamiltonian character of your model in the bulk. <coughs> so there are three aspects, as I said. I mean, one, uh, probably the historically the oldest and the most, maybe most fundamental aspect is the the green kubo theory of transport, the green kubo formula, which basically rests upon understanding the decay of current current correlations in the equilibrium. Uh, then there is uh, this, uh, at the last months and the last two years, a very popular aspect of uh, looking at diffusion from, uh, let's say, far from equilibrium perspective, of joining two equilibrium semi infinite systems together, for example, to 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 uh, pieces of metal at different temperatures, uh, you join them together and then you wait what happens. Uh, so you observe uh, the steady state which is formed in uh, a symptotic uh, region, which is formed uh, at late times. Uh, so uh, I mean, this is just a cartoon picture of 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 of, of, of space and time a diagram of this type of state. So what what you see is that basically that. Uh, you would uh, expect some sort of a region where you have some sort of non-zero current. The question is, what is the? I mean, can you understand the scaling of this region in time, uh, and the nature of the? I mean, the, the, the scaling of the current in time, and so on. <coughs> so, but basically, from this type of uh, non-equilibrium aspects, you can also try to define transport coefficients and uh, relate them to green kubo and so, so on. And then there is a third aspect, which is uh, basically probably the closest to the topic of this conference, uh, which is the. Uh, which is the one which I like most. And uh, I will try also to, to give you some, some links of this, uh, uh, this kind of paradigm to, to the previous two, at least to the, to the first one. So uh, <coughs> yeah, so this is the, the I, mean, you have a, I mean, you can also think of a finite piece of a system on which you want to basically study transport. And you attach it to some uh, stochastic reservoirs, to some infinite systems, uh, which you somehow trace out from your description. 
So what you're left with is, is, is a finite piece of a system which is coupled uh, to the environment via some Markovian processes. So you are thinking of here uh, to, to, to basically, I mean, you want to just describe the finitely many degrees of freedom, but you describe these two degrees of freedom stochastically, and the rest you describe in deterministic fashion. So you try to somehow separate stochastic boundaries from the deterministic world. And that, uh, that is, I mean, in classical physics, I mean, you can think of, uh, you know, writing some sort of Lajoin equation which only couples uh, uh, noise or uh, 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 to only to the first and the last particle, but in, in quantum you can think of some sort of Lindblad equation, Lindblad description, uh, uh, where the jump processes only affect boundary degrees of, degrees of freedom. <coughs> okay, so that's sort of the uh, short overview of what I will discuss uh, today. Uh, so I, I'll just start now with uh, some uh, basic green Kubo theory of quantum transport. Suppose you are interested in some sort of conductivity, which I uh, denote as, as, as kappa of omega. It doesn't really matter whether this is uh, spin conductivity, charge conductivity, uh, heat conductivity. It's all the same. The formula is always the same. It's this current-current correlator that you have to understand somehow how it behaves. So the Fourier transformer current-current correlator, but first taking the, 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 the thermodynamic limit and then a late time limit, you would uh, define this transport coefficient, k of omega. Uh, th of course, the order of limits here is important if you're interested in, 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 in statistical mechanics. And uh, in, throughout my talk, uh, little n will always be the uh, size of the system, number of, uh, uh, number of sites. Um, <coughs> and uh, from that, you can define, for example, uh, I mean, uh, what, what, what I will be interested here in particular is uh, the interplay between ballistic and diffusive transport. So it could happen in some cases, and in low dimensions, in one dimension this sometimes uh, quite typically happens, is that the conductivity would diverge at frequency zero. So you, you can then isolate this so-called Drude peak uh, with the Drude weight delta at D. Um, <coughs> so you can write the real part of conductivity in terms of a uh, delta contribution at omega equal to zero plus the regularized part. And uh, the, the, the Drude peak, uh, the, sorry, the Drude weight uh, uh, is then written again in terms of a Green Kubo formula, which is very similar to the formula for conductivity. The only difference being now that you take instead of the time integrated current current correlator, you, time, you, you get here time averaged current current correlator. Sometimes people say this is just uh, current current correlator at late times. Uh, it's the same, of course. If, uh, if current current correlator decays to some well defined value, it's the same, but uh, this would make sense even if current current correlator has some undamped oscillations. One can still define sort of uh, uh, through the weight, even though uh, C uh, current current correlation function at infinite times doesn't exist. <coughs> okay, and then uh, I mean this this quantity actually has a long history, even I mean in the context of low-dimensional and integrable systems. For example, <coughs> there was uh, this uh, uh, paper in '97 when Zotos and collaborators suggested to use uh, even late, uh, even older result of Mazur uh, and Suzuki uh, on um, a bounding uh, autocorrelator, autocorrelation functions, uh, that is the time average autocorrelation functions of uh, observables in terms of conserved quantities. So when you have some conserved quantities in your model, which I denote as capital Q of M, so these are some observables which are conserved in time, uh, then you can write sort of a very general bound <coughs> on uh, this type of object um, in terms of these co correlators, uh, and so, sorry, in terms of these uh, conserved operators, conserved uh, quantities. Uh, uh, of course, you can always choose these conserved quantities to be orthogonal, that is, that the overlap, the, the, the expectation value of the product of QM, QK is zero unless M is equal to K. Uh, <coughs> okay, so this is a basically very simple thing and it can be understood or derived in, in five minutes on a piece of uh, paper. Uh, and it simply follows from, uh, you know, optimizing this in trivial inequality. So we just write, uh, you know, uh, this type of inequality uh, so you take uh, the time integrated current, you subtract some combination of conserved charges, and it then you optimize with respect to the weights of this, uh, of this linear combination. Uh, and then you, at the end you take t to infinity limit. <coughs> and that's you know, when, how you get the Mazur bound. I mean, it's not, nothing really deep. Uh, <coughs> the, quest, the problem happens, of course, uh, if uh, all these conserved charges, which your integrable theories have, uh, are orthogonal to the current in question. I mean, this can happen. And uh, this is even generically happens in models which have, which have some sort of Z2 symmetries. So then you should somehow worry what, what, what to do. I mean, uh, 
but we'll, we'll discuss this question later. So, uh, yeah, so then there is this, okay, uh, this was the Green Kubo part, yeah? So now there is this uh, very sort of topical story on inhomogeneous uh, initial, I mean, inhomogeneous initial value problem. So people are now using a uh, combination of a theory of integrability uh, with uh, general ideas of hydrodynamics to, 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 to write some sort of hydrodynamic, uh, uh, generalized hydrodynamics, uh, which are essentially in this context uh, generalized Euler equations for the, conserved, for, the, for the density of conserved charges and the, the corresponding currents, which is kind of summarized in this formula. Uh, so basically what has been noted, uh, and this basically is based on sort of uh, nice observation that, uh, that, I mean, you know, integrable theories have infinitely, infinitely many conserved charges, and uh, all these conserved charges can be uh, 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 associated to some sort of quasi-particles. I mean, there is this quasi-particle description in terms of uh, thermodynamic beta ansatz, and uh, so then you can define basically this, uh, that, 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 I mean, there is this, <coughs> what the people call string charge duality, which corresponds basically to, to the string excitations in the uh, Heisenberg XXZ model, uh, to which you can define then charges. <coughs> and, uh, 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 okay, I mean, I didn't want uh, to go into much detail here. Uh, this was more like to be in, to, as in to in, in introduction, but the point is that this formula, even though it's very simple, it's a very powerful tool. Basically, the idea is here, I mean, okay, I mean, uh, as I say, I mean, I will no, not go into detail of, 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 of thermodynamic beta ansatz here, but the point is now that to these conserved charges that you then associate these densities, uh, this, uh, and these densities, of course, are functions of the some sort of momentum parameter or rapidity lambda, so we have to solve it for any lambda, and then once you have it, then you can basically write that time evolution or a steady state, if you want. Uh, uh, that is, uh, the steady state is completely determined uh, if you fix the ray x over t. So basically, it changes with respect to different uh, velocity x over t. But for a fixed x over t, then you have basically well-defined steady state. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then for this steady state, you can basically <coughs> compute all observables. Yeah. So for example, profile profile of the of the of the of the energy density or profile of the spin density or, or whatever. Of, of some sort of <coughs> interesting uh, observable, yeah. So this is just a, 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 a picture from a paper by uh, this uh, uh, second paper by Bertini et al. I mean, this was two re there was these two remarkable papers of last year. I mean, first there was paper by, by Benjamin Dion and uh, uh, collaborators, and then uh, almost the same time there was this paper by the Italian group, uh, where they basically set out the idea and uh, show that it works. Uh, okay, but this basically shows that there is ballistic transport. Yeah. So uh, the question is, uh, what can we do beyond ballistic transport? So this 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 this, this picture is very powerful if you want to know the, the the main feature of integrable dynamics. But the point is that sometimes the main feature is not the ballistic part. It's, it can be also the, the non-ballistic part. And uh, let's maybe discuss this a bit more. And uh, uh, let's now go into the uh, concrete model. So the main model of my talk is the basically one of the favorite models of uh, mathematical uh, physicists uh, of, uh, let's say could discuss uh, uh, integral systems, which is the XXZ model. Uh, <coughs> so uh, this is a spin one-half chain. Uh, basically, it's an anisotropic Heisenberg interaction. Uh, there is only one parameter, delta, which is called anisotropy. So if delta is equal to one, this is an, uh, basically just isotropic Heisenberg. And then if delta is larger than one, this is, uh, model is called uh, uh, well, it's like an easing like interaction, it's gapped, uh, and if delta is less than one, it's like xy interaction, and it's gapless. And uh, the main sort of, uh, uh, I mean, the main object behind the uh, integrability of this model is the so called Lux operator, <laughs> which, is a simple, which is a simple two by two matrix, but whose elements are sort of not scalars, but are again uh, uh, members, of, I mean, they are again uh, uh, some sort of operator valued, vo operator -valued uh, objects. Uh, which span the representation of this quantum group UQSL2. So this I denote as SZ, S plus, S minus. So it's a kind of, it, this is kind of quantum spins, but they are spins in which, which are living in auxiliary space and depend on the representation parameter, which I call little s, which, which is what I call spin, yeah? or auxiliary spin. I mean, this is, I mean, you don't have to basically understand where it comes from. I mean, this is basically the, the, the uh, one of the solutions of the so-called Young-Baxter equation, which is relevant to this model. And uh, this object de de determines all the uh, 
I mean, at least determines the, all the conserved charges of this model, <coughs> all the known conserved charges. For example, there are these unitary, what I will call unitary or compact uh, uh, charges, or from unitary uh, representations of UQSL2, which corresponds to spin being a half, in half integer. Uh, for example, you, you get all the local and quasi-local charges of the theory. For S1 half, this is the fundamental representation, you get the, quasi the really local charges, the charges which can be understood as, 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 as sums of strictly local densities sums or integrals of the space. And, uh, but then moreover, I mean, for S not half integer, but higher, higher half integers, sorry, for S not one half, but higher half integers, y you get this, uh, what uh, we nowadays call quasi-local charges, which are essentially local. I mean, for all physicists, uh, uh, needs they are like local charges, but they are not exactly local in the sense that uh, the densities are not supported strictly on finitely many spins, but they are supported on increasing number of spins and, uh, in terms of some sort of convergence series. <coughs> and um, yeah, so that is, uh, I mean, this is how you write these guys. So basically, they are coming as some sort of logarithmic derivative, logarithmic derivatives of what is called the transfer matrix, that is the, the, the trace over the auxiliary space of a tensor product of flux operators. So you tensor product with respect to different physical spaces. So this is a two by two matrix. This, this two by two matrix you can understand as physical spin. And then you take a tensor product over n physical spins. But you take a product in terms of auxil in auxiliary space, then you take the log and the derivative. So, and uh, then you take it, you have to take it at a particular point, uh, which is in this case just uh, e related to the anisotropy. This eta is the parameter related to anisotropy. And then you get a local object or a quasi local object. <coughs> so this object is uh, basically, this is the same Q which is used in this generalized hydrodynamics. Of Bertini et al. So, um, yeah, that's how you get uh, in the real space, if you want, uh, the corresponding charges. Yes? Auxiliary space is the space where you, uh, I mean, it's just a representation space of this uh, spin, S. So uh, you have to associate to your model some extra Hilbert space, which has seemingly nothing to do with physics but your lux operator should have one leg in this space and another leg in physical space. So it somehow co correlates the auxiliary space with physical space. And then you take the trace over auxiliary space. Yeah. So it's basically it's difficult to explain intuitively because there is not much intuition with this auxiliary space. That's, that's a mathematical construction. Okay. <coughs> Uh, I mean, it's basically the, that's the, the key the key element in this algebraic beta ansatz or quantum inverse, quantum inverse scattering method. So it's it's the, the, the key object in the uh, in the theory of quantum integrity. <coughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> so then, but then the point is now there is another sort of uh, way of uh, making a conserved charge which is still quasi local, is that you take the same auxiliary space, uh, uh, so you take the same transfer matrix, the same uh, construction, but now instead of taking the derivative with respect to the, uh, the spectral parameter, okay, I forgot to say what is this phi, I mean this phi is the so-called spectral parameter, I write it now in this trigonometric way, but it's always there, I mean in, when you have this lux matrix there always has to be some sort of free parameter. It's related to this parameter lambda, the rapidity in the the other formulation. <coughs> but here I like to write it in this, uh, in this uh, <coughs> trigonometric way. Okay, so now, uh, I mean, what I'm saying now is that there is a w second, second possibility how to define a, a conserved charge is that you take a partial derivative not, respect to with, not with respect to the spectral parameter, but with respect to a representation parameter, with respect to the complex spin. So the idea is now to treat a spin, I mean, as a complex parameter, not as a half integer. So your, uh, your, your, your highest weight uh, representation will never terminate because you will not have half, half integer spin. So your representation will be manifestly infinitely dimensional uh, in generic case. But in case where eta over pi, where eta is this uh, anisotropy parameter is irrational, the representation will still terminate, but for other reasons. I, I will not go into this group theoretic uh, uh, discussion here, but uh, I mean, there are, uh, one can show that this representation uh, of this S, Z, S plus, S minus is still finite and dimensional if it over pi is, is, is irrational. Okay, in, and in this way, you can still define an operator which is uh, conserved, the Z of phi, a family, in fact, because phi is a, 
is a, is a, is a, is a cyclic uh, spectral parameter. And, uh, <coughs> and yeah, and this, this, uh, these operators ha ha have actually nice properties with respect to some sort of uh, simple symmetry of the model. For example, there is this Z2 symmetry, which I mentioned in the title of this uh, transparency. And uh, this is, in this case, the Z2 symmetry is simply spin reversal. So there is this uh, uh, spin reversal, which is a product of Pauli matrices, whose square is equal to identity, uh, which has this property that it commutes with the Hamiltonian. So Hamiltonian is spin reversal invariant. You can uh, flip the spin, but still you have the same Hamiltonian. But the spin current, uh, spin current can be written simply as uh, sigma plus, sigma minus, minus intermission adjoint at different uh, at, 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 uh, neighboring sides. And the point is that spin current is negative, is, is, is odd under spin reversal. So once you have this property, I mean, then, I mean, and then, of course, also all these uh, this unitary or compact uh, quasi-local charges, QLS, uh, are, are even under spin reversal. They commute with spin reversal operation. Which means that they are all kind of irrelevant to understand. Uh, I mean, if you want to insert them into Mazur bound, they are they only give zero 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 overlap with the with the current, right? Because they have negative, uh, they have opposite uh, symmetry. <coughs> you can there is this simple uh, argument which shows that this this thing, uh, this, this all these products, uh, all these inner products of J times Q should vanish. <laughs> but the point is now that the, there is this extra charge, a non-unitary non charge, which has this, n uh, this, this, this interesting symmetry, which is not uh, basically not, a, I mean, if you understand this as a kind of a parity operation, now this has a parity symmetry, right? The Qs also have are parity invariant. But this guy is not parity invariant, but if you can think of it like a CPT invariant, because if you, if you conju conjugate it with S, then it, it corresponds to taking the transpose, which is the time reversal operation, <laughs> plus taking some sort of a charge conjugation, because you, you, you change spectral parameter from pi to pi, 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 pi minus pi. So, I mean, this, this sort of different symmetry somehow uh, immediately tells you that, I mean, this, this weak, weak, weaker symmetry, I mean, no, uh, uh, has an important consequence, namely the, the overlap of this guy with the uh, uh, with the current is not zero. So it can give it can, it can give you non-zero contribution to the Mazur bound. <coughs> and as a consequence, one can derive actually what uh, is the uh, what is the uh, value of the Mazur bound on the uh, on the spin through the weight. So this is the the point here. I mean, is uh, to discuss uh, spin transport. Yeah, so spin transport has this negative uh, uh, Z2 uh, symmetry. So uh, 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 and then there was this debate for uh, many years. I mean, whether spin to the weight is zero or not, uh, which was not this, uh, on which people could not decide. And so uh, uh, one needed this new charge uh, to come into play in order to show that the Z2 weight is actually non-vanishing. And uh, moreover, this through the weight is not only non-vanishing, but it's a funny function of the parameter of the model. If this delta is a, a parameter of the model, which is in isotropy, the lower bound uh, on through the weight, the Mazur bound, is actually this function, this black, <coughs> the red or the black. The red is, uh, is obtained by, by considering a single uh, <coughs> Z charge, but the black is obtained by considering the whole family of Z charges, which is kind of fully optimized. And it has this particular uh, 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 explicit form. Uh, in terms of uh, rational expression for the uh, um, uh, eta over pi. Yeah? Eta of pi over pi is L over m, so this is two, in two integers. And it turns out it is nowhere continuous function of, 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 of eta or of delta. So, I mean, it's kind of uh, interesting, right, that you, you have a sort of a model, a very simple quantum model for which uh, its, thermo its thermodynamic properties are not continuous functions of parameter. Right? I mean, one has to probably make uh, some sort of uh, deep breath and try to see if one has some immediate objections to that claim or not. <coughs> uh, I, I think it's kind of acceptable, but uh, still, I mean, some people like uh, to debate on this. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. But anyway, so for a while, I mean, this was kind of derived in 2013 uh, in the paper with Dilevsky. And, um, <coughs> and then uh, for, a, for a while, for three or four years, I mean, I believe that, uh, well, I mean, I dis well, I mean, I, I always say this is lower bound, so there could be some extra charges which would smooth this de dependence. So the actual ballistic uh, transport coefficient could be, a, in principle, a smooth function of a parameter. And then there was this paper a couple of months, a couple of months ago by Denardis and Ilyevsky, where they used exactly these uh, generalized hydrodynamics ideas to derive uh, the Druder weight, and they have shown basically that they, they, what they get is exactly this formula. So basically, they have kind of shown, using this this this, this, this perspective, 
that uh, 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 spin through the weight is actually a fractal function of the parameter, or no continuous function of the parameter. So we basically, through the one, I mean, through the weight as we derived uh, uh, in 2013 is actually seems to be saturated. So there is the, this is basically an optimal bound. <laughs> okay, but the question is now what happens here? I mean, uh, I mean, this is for, for for delta less than one. You have ballistic transport with uh, finally uh, uh, looking through the weight. Uh, and then for delta larger than one, I mean, uh, due to the weight uh, seems to be vanishing. Uh, and uh, yeah, the question is what happens there? <coughs> so what happens with spin transport for delta equal or larger than one? And here I will just show some slides from a very recent uh, paper that we have uh, posted, uh, where we use this sort of idea of inhomogeneous initial states uh, to basically just look empirically, I mean, using uh, numerical techniques, like uh, we used the uh, TDMRG. Uh, uh, to look at uh, the steady state profiles and uh, the uh, scaling of the currents or transported charge or materialization. So what we have uh, done here, we have started from initial state, which is like, uh, I mean, uh, it turns out that this state has kind of interest with respect to uh, Z2 symmetry of the model. Namely, this state is, uh, is such that uh, there is no ballistic transport. Uh, uh, so if you basically, apply this state to a, to a, to a generalized hydrodynamic uh, framework of uh, Doyon and Bertini and company, uh, basically you will get zero. You will get no, uh, no propagation of materialization. You will get that materialization basically, if you scale this uh, zeta is x over t, you, say, you see that basically nothing happens, that uh, uh, the profile, materialization profile is basically st still a step function. So you have to scale differently. You have to scale not x over t, but you have to scale x over t to the alpha, some power of t. And then you will see that you, 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 you open and you, you spread. So I mean, this is just, but this is just experimental uh, physics. Yeah? I mean, uh, it's just uh, investigating how, how things uh, work without really understanding them. So we, we start with this initial state. And this initial state means basically that you have some sort of uh, uh, chemical potential or magnetization uh, on the left and the opposite on the right. So you have opposite polarized uh, uh, magnetic domains. You join them. And then uh, the magnetization starts to, fl to flow. And the question is, what is the profile? Of, this is the, 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 the picture of profile of magnetization at delta equal to 1, the isotropic case, and delta equal to 2, the gap case. And uh, these uh, greens are just to guide the eye with some power loss, t to the 2 thirds, and this is t to the 1 half. Yeah? And, um, and these are uh, profiles of the current. Yeah? So this is current density at time x, at time t, at position x, for the two cases. <coughs> OK, these are just pictures, but the question is, uh, more quantitative, I mean, how things scale. So for example, one, one object which is, uh, which, which is a simple number, which tells you a lot about the transport, is uh, uh, what we call the transported uh, magnetization, delta S of t, which is just the time integral of the spin, uh, 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 spin current at uh, the position of the, of the cut, or the position when the two halves are joined, n over 2. So we just uh, uh, integrated this current, and uh, suppose this is some power into the alpha. The question is, what is this power? And this actually can be determined rather accurately. So for example, for the isotropic case, we, uh, we just look at the local slope, that is that the logarithmic derivative of this delta S of t as a function of t. And uh, we find that it approaches basically a value which is very close to 2 thirds. And if you just fit uh, to delta S of t, we just fit the power and we get alpha, which is 0 0.67. And uh, remarkably, I mean, this is kind of something which I want to stress here. I mean, for people who do DMRG, they are probably, they should be surprised uh, when uh, they see such a long time scale, right? I mean, usually DMRG works on uh, at least order of magnitude shorter times. So there's a reason why this works what much better here, which we don't understand, but we will, I will discuss a bit later. I mean, these entanglement entropies here grow very slowly <coughs> for some reason. And it, this has to do with the structure of the initial state. So there has to be something solvable behind this. And usually these things imply also that it's more easily simulable. OK, so, um, <coughs> so this is the, the isotropic case. It has this t to the 2 thirds uh, dependence on the transported charge. And uh, in the gapped case, you find something which is very close to 1 half. So here, a bit convergence is a bit slower, but it's consistent with hypothesis that it should be diffusive. For example, the the, 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 the ultimate exponent which we are able to fit or reach until uh, numerically accessible times is uh, of order 0 0.52. So as I say, uh, consistent with assuming that it should be diffused. OK, so this is a more or less cartoon uh, picture what, what, of the transport in x, x, z. So for the gapless case, you have ballistic transport. 
for the gaps case, you have diffusive. And here, you have some sort of super diffusive with the yeah, slope two thirds. And this is just the, in the inset, we have this, uh, some de numerically determined diffusion constant as a function of the, as a function of the anisotropy. And, uh, yeah, and it seems that basically diffusion constant, of course, diverges when delta goes to 1. It seems that there is diffu super diffusion there. But then it basically goes to a, some sort of constant. Yeah? Um, so for large delta, I mean, there should be some, maybe there should be a way. If, if there is some analytical approach to this diffusion, uh, calculating diffusion constant, maybe this is easiest in the easing limit. Because it seems that there is a well-defined diffusion constant in the easing limit. So it would be really nice to, to, to try to attempt to calculate it. OK, and then there is also some uh, question of, I mean, what should be the, this uh, linear response or driving parameter? I mean, our results are basically obtained for mu, uh, which is quite small. I mean, it turns out that the long times are accessible for very small mu, which, is, which could be understood as some sort of linear response physics. And mu is equal to 1 corresponds to a pure kink that is fully ferromagnetic left and ferromagnetic right with different uh, uh, axis of polarization in different directions. Uh, uh, and so uh, we use different, different methods to determine the, uh, the two regimes. For example, in the small mu regime, we use the density operator evolution, where we represent density operators as matrix product operators in our DDMRG codes. DDMRG codes. And uh, in the large mu regime, we use pure wave function. Uh, and then uh, some sort of stochastic uh, sampling uh, uh, to get the density operator. Uh, so I mean, what, is, what, what could be also remarkable to notice is that for mu equal to 1, I mean, there was results which were obtained uh, almost 10 years ago by, uh, I think, uh, Gunther Schutz and some other people um, uh, using this, uh, the same, exactly the same sort of, uh, well, the same. They used this uh, exact kink initial state, that is mu equal to 1. And they argued that the, the exponent alpha should be 0.6. Indeed, we find 0.6, but only at mu very large. And then when mu goes to a small value, we find that basically it goes to 2 thirds. Yeah. Uh, and of course, for intermediate mu, our results are not very accurate. I mean, it turns out that for intermediate mu, simulations are not very trusted. But for very small mu and for very large mu, they are very, uh, much, much better. OK, so now let's look at some profiles. <coughs> so. Um, uh, for example, if you look at the spin density profile, uh, uh, and then you see how it scales with time, it turns out that it basically goes to a perfect error function. I mean, perfect meaning that we cannot determine from numerical simulations that it's not error function. Um, <coughs> and uh, and these are just three different times scaled. Yeah, and uh, this is uh, and this is just direct verification of uh, spin fixed law. If you want, uh, this is uh, just comparing the spin current density and the gradient of spin density, and we plot one on top of each other, and we find basically that the two things are nicely matching. Um, and yeah, and this is working for both cases, for delta equal to 1, delta equal to 2, even for delta, even though for delta equal to 1, you have to scale with the t x over 2 to the t, t, uh, 2 x over t to the 2 thirds. Now the question is, where does it come from? I mean, it's this kind of curious observation. Why should one, why should one have this strange diffusive-like super diffusion? I mean, uh, the transport seems to be super diffusive, but the, 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 the profile seems to be kind of essentially error function, essentially diffusion profile. So it's like, I mean, this is just phenomenological fitting, if you want. It is like if you had diffusion equation, but in time, which is not real time, but in some power loss scale time. So if, if you write tau, which is t to the 4 thirds, then you have basically diffusion constant in x and tau. Yeah. <coughs> you have diffusion equation in x and tau. OK, I mean, that's just interpreting the data, nothing else. And this is why things work so well, because uh, if you look at uh, entanglement entropy across the bipartition, I mean, this is the usual quantity that people look at uh, when they study efficiency of uh, DMRG. I mean, this entanglement entropy should, I mean, usually grows linearly with time, and that's why DMRG has to stop so soon. But if this uh, thing grows uh, slower, for example, for MBL, for many body localization, it grows typically logarithmically in time. And that's why you can simulate MBL states much more, much easier in DMRG. Now, in our case, it seems that this guy, the entanglement entropy actually also slows, uh, also the case increases quite, quite slowly. It, it, it increases with some sort of power loss with power, which is usually much, much less than one. Uh, I mean, this is for two cases, for a pure state evolution where you have sim uh, the usual entanglement entropy or for the st density operator evolution for which we have this, what we call operator state, operator space entanglement entropy, which is basically 
the Schmid, effective Schmidt rank of bipartition, I mean, of, of writing your density operator as a matrix product state. I mean, it's, 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 it's nothing, it has nothing to do with entanglement, really, but it's, uh, it's a technical concept which is close to entropy of, 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 of a density operator. I mean, of, of, a, of a vectorized density operator, better to say. Okay, and anyway, so yeah, that's basically <coughs> why it works. I mean, from just I mean, technically why it works, but you know, physically we don't really understand why it works so well. Okay, so uh, yeah, that was uh, just some 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 phenomenology to to motivate that uh, something uh, really interesting can still go on, uh, uh, still going on, which is not understood. And uh, next, I would like to discuss a simple, a very simple connection that we have noticed uh, together with uh, my student, my PhD student, Marco Medeniak uh, and Christoph Karas, <coughs> uh, on um, basically connection on between through the weights and diffusion constants. So uh, it turns out, I mean, when you have these models, which are, I mean, what we have here is, of course, uh, XXZ, uh, what we have in mind, but uh, the connection should, some, should somehow, somehow be general. And I will show you at the end of my talk also uh, a model where this connection can be established, basically by exact calculation. So, um, yeah, so there are these two green cubo formulas, but I'm writing them now for the finite t, finite size, and finite, actually finite filling, right, also of our problem. I mean, there is this uh, conservation law, which is uh, the trivial conservation law, which is like a total charge, which is conserved. In the magnetic system, this is just a total magnetization, which is conserved. And uh, then I call this uh, the average uh, density, I call the uh, uh, filling ratio x, or uh, magnetization, which is uh, the relative. Uh, I mean, <coughs> yeah. So I mean, the point is now you have this conservation law. Uh, I mean, you have this conserved quantity. Uh, and then you can define your uh, statistical ensemble also with respect to the fixed value of this conserved, conserved quantity, fixed value. Yeah? So instead of just writing the standard canonical expectation value, which is beta, you also write it in terms of beta and x. Yeah? So this you do in, by introducing a projector, uh, which projects to a sector of Hilbert space with a fixed magnetization or fixed filling. And then you can basically decompose your uh, expectation value. Into, I mean, you, can, you write expectation value in terms of this uh, you know, product of uh, operator times a projector on this subspace. <coughs> Okay, so now this is basically how you would define the drew the weight at the finite value of magnetization, so or finite feeling. Yeah. Because if, even though if drew the weight is zero in the gapped Heisenberg, for example, it is not zero if you go away from half feeling. I mean, half feeling <coughs> is, is the thermodynamically dominant part of the Hilbert space. Uh, so, I mean, the half field sector is the thermodynamically dominant part. So, uh, in thermodynamic limit, you will basically see zero drew the weight because there is no drew the weight in the half field sector. But there is always through the weights in, 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 in non half field sectors, which of course don't contribute to thermodynamics because the, the relative uh, fraction of states there is vanishing. <coughs> but, the point our, uh, but the point we want to make here now is when you approach a thermodynamic limit, I mean, and that, that was even some confusion I mean, in the literature. If you look at papers from the end of the 90s where people discussed through the weights, I mean, there were some claims that in the gapped regime, uh, the system has to be insulated. Because people have looked, I mean, they had these microcanonical Lanzos codes, and they have looked only at the part of Hilbert space which has exactly uh, half field, yeah? zero magnetization. And there they found the system behaves like an isolator. Even though when you, know, when you look in grand canonical example, it's clearly, it seems clearly diffusing. And so there was this, 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 this mismatch of uh, microcanonical and grand canonical ensemble with respect to uh, spin uh, diffusivity. So, uh, <coughs> now the question is, can this be somehow now uh, connected to through the weights uh, uh, when you go away from half field? Yeah? Uh, so and that is what ha so what usually happens is when you have this z two symmetry then, and uh, the x equals zero sector is z two symmetric. Uh, for example, this spin reversal or, or a particle hole transformation, uh, then you can argue that uh, the through the weight should behave like a quadrat quadratic function of this uh, symmetry breaking parameter, the, the field equation x. And so. And then there is, as I say, there is a very simple idea how to connect uh, spin, uh, uh, spin diffusion and uh, uh, spin, uh, diffusion constant and through the weights. And the idea has uh, three steps. Uh, first, you write uh, basically from the linear response expression for finite time and finite, space, finite size. Uh, you connect the two things. Yeah, I mean, you see that uh, basically you can just argue that diffusion constant is, is a sum over all particle sectors uh, determined by x. Uh, uh, using these weights, these are just statistical weights of different particle sector at finite time, finite size. 
uh, times the, the, the Dulder weight at this corresponding, uh, this corresponding uh, particle sector. Which, uh, yeah. And then, uh, the, the, of course, the important thing is how you would scale, how you would scale the science, uh, the, 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 uh, the space uh, to infinite, size to infinity and time to infinity limits. And so here, what you do is you use uh, uh, scale limit when the two uh, uh, n and, uh, and uh, t are in fixed ratio, but the ratio is at least as large as so the ratio you call velocity, and this velocity should be at least as large as Lie-Bromis Lie velocity. That is, in quantum spin systems, there is a sort of a, uh, a maximum velocity with which any correlation can spread. So if your v is larger than than, than uh, if v is larger than v, v Robinson, then there is basically your results should, could not depend on v. So the idea is just you take a V large enough. And then you consider large D asymptotics. Then you would take, take a single scale, scale limit, D to infinity. And the, 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 thir the third step is that you basically, uh, uh, when you do the large D asymptotics, then you, you basically write the Dulder weight at large times uh, as uh, asymptotic Dulder weight plus 1 over T times D1 plus the rest. So you t basically expand Dulder weight in 1 over T, and basically you keep just the zeroth order. But actually, the first order uh, could be understood just as a Dulder weight in the presence of convective terms. That is, uh, when you I mean, sorry, it can be understood as a diffusion constant. It agrees with the definition of diffusion constant, which you have when you have some sort of convective terms. And then you have to subtract the, the, the infinite time correlator uh, to get the drop rate diffusion constant. And that's exactly what you want. <coughs> and that has to be non-negative. So this is we throw away. And then we get a lower bound. So basically, you, you connect these two things. This is the, the diffusion constant. This is the Drude weight expression. You, you throw away this thing, and then you get something which, is, which cannot be larger. And then at the end of the day, you get a simple bound, which is the diffusion constant is large or equal to some expression, which depends on the Lee Robinson velocity. I mean, basically, you optimize this. You take the optimal V, which is just Lee Robinson. And then this depends on static uh, susceptibility, inverse temperature, and uh, and uh, the second derivative of, of second derivative of energy density with respect to the uh, with respect to the uh, feeling threshold. Okay, uh, <coughs> yeah. And uh, basically, if you don't like, I mean, this expression still is a, looks a bit messy. I mean, there are many quantities here, but uh, there is a very simple expression in, 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 in the high temperature limit. In the high temperature limit, this expression has this form. And um, yeah, and this you can basically check in a particular model. For example, at least you can check that this makes sense in the Heisenberg XXZ model by checking how the lower bound, uh, how the, the, the how do the weight depends on the on the feeling ratio x. So, for example, for x equal to 1.5, sorry, for delta for the isotropy which is larger than one, you find that there is nice uh, quadratic x dependence uh, at x close to zero, uh, and this is compared. Uh, I mean, this is basically what we do here. We compare the Mazur bound on the on through the weight which we can evaluate using these quasi-local conserved charges up to the value of auxiliary spin 1 half, 1, 2, two, two and so on, so up to 5 over 2. And then we compare it with the state of the RD MRG results, which uh, Christoph Karash has done. And, uh, and then we found sort of nice agreement. Uh, I mean, it seems, seems to be nicely converging you know, for sufficiently large S. And of course, I mean, we don't plot really a lot around x equal to 0, because here th things become very difficult from a numerical point of view. So this is just a consistency check that things are really looking quadratic at around x equal to, x equal to 0. And then the slope, the curvature of, of, of through the weight here should be something which determines the, the, the diffusion constant. Yeah? <coughs> and I mean, this is kind of looking kind of consistent. But uh, much more delicate things happen at, again, isotropic point. Yeah? Because at isotropic point, we expect the fusion constant to diverge. And this could be consistent with the fact that this d of x has non-analytic behavior at, uh, around x equal to 0. And this is indeed what seems to be happening. I mean, it seems to be, at least the MRG data shows that this d of x here is probably linear in x. Yeah? So that should be somehow, could be consistent with the fact that we have infinite diffusion constant. <coughs> OK, uh, yeah, so now let's me, let me move on and go uh, spend like five minutes on the third approach to transport. Um, for example, suppose you have uh, 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 um, now, uh, some boundaries. So suppose now you want to treat as a finite system, and uh, uh, you put it into contact with some boundaries. Uh, suppose you want these boundaries to be simple and Markovian, and then there is a generic uh, equation of motion that you people study in this context, which is the Lindblad equation, or Lindblad equal to the Kovsky-Sudarshan equation. So a path from the Hamiltonian, which is which would be our simple 
integrable, let's say, x and z Hamiltonian in the bulk, we would consider some boundary processes, and these boundary processes would be uh, limited to, would be, I mean, supported by, uh, you know, we would take only jump operators which are supported on degrees of freedom near the boundary, that is, at x equal to 1 or x equal to n. I mean, this is a very strong assumption, of course, from the point of view of deriving this type of uh, open quantum system dynamics. These are strong assumptions, and uh, but you know you can argue that in some cases you know, this can be justified, and uh, in the other cases you can simply say, okay, this is a minimal model of open quantum systems which can be solved, and uh, <coughs> from that you can derive some interesting aspects of, of transport. Okay, so now I think I have to hurry up a little bit, but th this is kind of not so uh, new story. Uh, so I will just uh, give you a, a sort of a, a short flash of, I mean. I mean, actually, I, will, I should not even uh, attempt to go into any technical detail here. The idea is now to attempt to solve the steady state Lindbad equation. So the idea is to solve the steady state and to try to determine the full density matrix of the steady state. And uh, these are the, the, the four jump operators which you can attach to your system. Uh, this is kind of a spin raising, raising and lowering operators on the left and on the right. So for example, there is this epsilon, which is everywhere, which is the overall coupling, which I call system path coupling strength. And then there is this mu, which is the, the bias, or the imbalance of spin from between left and right, uh, which is kind of a non equilibrium driving or a bias. And uh, in case mu is equal to 1, only in this case, when mu is equal to 1, this is the fast, fa farthest from equilibrium driving, uh, where you want to completely polarize spin up on the left and completely polarize spin down on the right which could be somehow interpreted as a pure source of spin on the left and pure sink of spin on the right with no uh, counter processes. In this case, you can write exact uh, expression for the density operator in the steady state, which, is, uh, which has this matrix product form. And uh, remarkably, this matrix product expression is basically equivalent to writing some sort of a highest weight transfer matrix using exactly the same lux operator as I discussed before, this UQS and two lux operator. So but now it's not a trace over auxiliary space. Now it's a, a ground state expectation value with respect to auxiliary space. So this, this zero is the, is the <coughs> basically a special state, which is the ground state uh, or vacuum of uh, this, uh, or uh, basically highest weight state of this uh, uh, spin S, uh, complex spin representation. So this is a complex spin representation. And this spin S is basically now related to dissipation, to epsilon. And it's an imaginary number. So it's a complex number. So this, 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 this highest weight series can never terminate. So this, this is really manifestly infinite, infinitely dimensional uh, matrix product uh, representation, explicit representation, and yeah, and basically we define the object that we need before. So that's how it looks. I mean, and uh, it's not so. Then once you have this sort of ansatz, it's not difficult to show that it works. Uh, what is quite remarkable is that uh, basically this defines uh, a commuting family of operators. I mean. If you just uh, look at this operator, which is just a piece of, uh, I mean, this is just a square root of, uh, if you want, a density operator or an amplitude operator out of which you form density operator as omega, omega, dagger. Uh, <coughs> so this omega is a function of two parameters, two complex parameters, the spectral and the, the, the representation parameter. And it turns out that it commutes. It, it forms a commuting family with respect to any, any four triple, any pairs of uh, fi and pi prime and s and s prime. I mean, that's, that's actually why it generates so nice charges, right? Because this basically, this commutativity means that this, uh, I mean, and this commutativity comes from simply uh, observing that this Lux operator satisfies young baxter equation, the appropriate young baxter equation, out of which you can find the Hamiltonian and, uh, and the commutativity of this guy. OK, I mean, the, the point I want to make here is just that uh, uh, once you have this explicit solution, then you can also compute the physical observables in this state. So this state is, uh, is a nice state. It's a state of a finite quantum system, which is correlated. I mean, it's not trivial, but it's a correlated state. And you can calculate all observables. For example, you can calculate uh, spin profiles again, and you can calculate uh, the, 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 the scaling of the current, uh, I mean, the, the, the dependence of the steady state current with respect to the system size. So you find, again, ballistic transport for delta less than 1. So you find these uh, ballistic profiles and current which doesn't depend on system size. You find. Uh, uh, exponentially decaying currents that is insulating behavior for delta larger than one. So you see now that you have different non-diffusive transport in this particular state for the reason being that this is a special state because it has this mu equal to one. So this state is not, is not telling you about linear response physics, it's, it's something else. But nevertheless, this state 
I mean, it contains a lot of information about transport, which I have no time to discuss here, but to continue discussing here, but, uh, but still it's, I, I would argue it's still kind of interesting to understand this state, to understand uh, some aspects of transport in the, in the model. <coughs> anyway, this state might be interesting from the experimental point of view. I mean, this is a simple state. Uh, if one would be able to engineer this type of protocol, this is the state you should get in your lab. I mean, so that's, uh, <coughs> OK, so that's, that's this. And then, uh, for example, you can compute uh, two points. Uh, for example, you can compute higher point correlation functions, like spin-spin uh, correlation function in the steady state. This, 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 this object has kind of interesting. I mean, this, this is just an, is an example for delta equal to 1. For the isotropic case, for example, you have this interesting cosine shape uh, density. Uh, you have this, and then you have this uh, also trigonometric like uh, current, current uh, sorry, spin-spin correlation functions. <coughs> okay, so now uh, in the last five minutes, I guess, uh, I can now just go a little bit away from quantum mechanics and uh, ask myself a question. I mean, how important is to understand quantum mechanics to understand quantum transport? And is there really something quantum in quantum transport in the um, Is there something related or something similar also in, uh, like for example, like these ballistic diffusive transitions in, 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 in classical integrable lattices? Yeah, <laughs> I argue there is. So uh, probably, I mean, hopefully, I don't know, uh, or someone will be disappointed, I don't know. But uh, maybe all that there is, I mean, one has to understand uh, simply the classical, <coughs> maybe even some classical, simple classical interacting uh, systems. Everything could be already there. For, so for example, this is a, basically a classical XXZ model. It's, it's a lat lattice lambda Lipschitz model. It's integrable. It can be formulated as a classical spin lattice where interaction only depends on the values of uh, spin, which are now points on a sphere, the unit, unit, unit you know, normalized direction vectors, Sx, uh, which obey now this standard uh, yeah, I mean, <coughs> uh, equations of motion, I mean, the Hamilton equation of motions with this corresponding Poisson bracket. And they are given by, by this Hamiltonian. And Hamiltonian is a bit messy function, I agree, but uh, even though I mean, it's a messy function, it's this completely integrable model. It has many conserved quantities. And uh, it can be understood, I mean, as a sort of classical limit of XXZ because XXZ doesn't have integrable classical limit, but this model is integral. So it's a kind of deformation of going to classical limit. And uh, then there is this delta parameter, which is a kind of uh, uh, anisotropy parameter, delta larger than one. La da, now this is like a logarithm of capital delta. So delta larger than zero corresponds to easing like behavior or easy axis delta less than zero becomes uh, corresponds to easy plane or x y, and we see diffusive ballistic here and delta equal to zero is an isotropic point where this uh, interaction is really Heisenberg like, but the logarithm of Heisenberg, and then this this, this this looks like anomalous, and moreover, I mean it looks uh, very similar to to what we have seen in XXZ. I mean this was a paper uh, like four years ago with my student at that time, Bojan uh, Junkovic. And we looked at this, uh, uh, I mean, these are just green kubo uh, spatial temporal uh, current current correlation functions. And you see that in the, uh, in the XY regime, I mean, you have this ballistic behavior. In the uh, easing light regime, you have this diffusive behavior. And the uh, intermediate regime, you have this something in between. I don't know. We haven't looked uh, very quantitative. I mean, we haven't analyzed this in very uh, much detail here. But uh, uh, of course, and then this is the lower picture is simply by uh, looking at the same structure as here, where you have diffusive transport. I mean, we were kind of surprised to see diffusion. So we said, well, how, how can this be compatible with the fact that you have solitons in your model? So if you just, I mean, this, this has been done by Monte Carlo simulation, where you take a sample over many initial states. And now if you just take a spurer sample, just reduce the number of initial states from a couple of thousands to a couple of tens, then you get this, 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 this cars here. And these cars are simply solitons. And they're contributions of solitons. So some initial condition has just some solitons. And then the solitons turns out to be important to calculate this autocorrelation function. And then this would be somehow giving you some sort of ballistic contribution. But it turns out that when you take the average over a sample of initial conditions, then the ballistic contribution vanishes. So there is no solitons anymore. And there is just this diffusive part. OK, and now if you just integrate uh, the total current, current correlation function, that is what you get. So you get this ballistic uh, transport here. Then you get this, uh, basically, something which in the case of unity fast. You can define conductivity, so this is diffusive. And then here, this is the, uh, the, the critical case, the isotropic case. Again, you find this t, t to the, I mean, now the current current correlator defined, uh, decays as t to minus some power, which is larger than minus 1, or, or, yeah, larger than minus 1. But 
it is something which is close to two-thirds. Now, if, if, if it was two-thirds, I think this would be the, consistent with what we see in quantum mechanics. Exactly. So it's uh, basically it could be just related to SU2 symmetry. We don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it seems that basically we have seen the physics. <coughs> okay, now maybe I, maybe I should stop now. Yeah. So I, I wanted to tell you something, uh, uh, something else about classical model, but uh, obviously I mean this is sort of the most recent work, uh, but. Uh, I maybe not, uh, maybe not even enter into that because it would take me at least five more minutes. Uh, I just want to, s to mention that there is another model on which we can calculate a lot because it's a kind of simple model. Uh, <coughs> it's, a, it's a model of, basically it's a cellular automaton model, but it is somehow related to an, an, an older model which people have investigated a lot, which is the heart a lot of gas. Uh, and the model, the model somehow has diffusion built into it, but even though it is interacting and and for that model, we can calculate diffusion constants, we can calculate uh, through the weights, we can calculate, and there is, there is basically some the whole algebraic machinery to calculate everything. And uh, the, the idea, the interesting point is now we can this, you have this explicit expression for the, for the time dependent current current correlator uh, from which you can calculate the, the conductivity, the through the weight, and uh, the diffusion constant, and the through the weight. And then you can check. Basically, this is a remarkable here is that you can check that this curvature inequality is saturated here. Basically, it just is, is, pure, is, a, is a pure equality yeah, using this object. That you can come from. So, I mean, at least we have found a model which saturates this bound. So somehow we feel kind of nice. I mean, that you have this uh, as a consistency check. <coughs> okay, so uh, with this, I would like to conclude. So, uh, if there is some conclusion from my talk, I mean, uh, then maybe the simple conclusion is that. Uh, despite the belief uh, with which I sort of entered uh, the exciting game of science, I mean, the beginning of the 90s, I mean, there was these papers uh, which claimed that there is, uh, one needs some sort of microscopic chaos to have normal transport. Uh, this seems to be not ne necessary. I mean, the, the it's simple, uh, uh, sim simple randomness in or entropy in the initial state suffices to, to have diffusion. Uh, uh, then, uh, for systems with additional Z2 symmetries, such that the current is anti-symmetric, uh, we found, and this is probably I would like to make sort of as a main claim of my talk, is that uh, there could be some sort of uh, subtle links between ballistic and diffusive uh, transport coefficients. Um, yeah. <coughs> and, uh, well, the, the main question uh, which is in the air now is, uh, I mean, for which uh, I have no clue, uh, how, what is what would be the mechanism if, if we somehow understand that uh, you know <coughs> uh, the diffusion is kind of a natural thing to have in, in uh, interacting uh, many particle systems? It is not clear how one gets anomalous diffusion, how one can get this uh, scaling uh, in an isotropic Heisenberg problem. So, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. <coughs> So, I think so. Yeah. I mean, uh, to, uh, yeah. I, I mean, we try to some of these uh, guesses. Yeah, we even compare to KPZ profile, and it but seems that yet another, it know, seems that it can be ruled out. Just, just to, you know, plot this, this Levy distribution. No, Levy is certainly ruled out. <coughs> Yeah, well, uh, no, um, no, no, we haven't done that, no, no, that's a good point, yeah. 
we haven't done that. No. So start from a pure king, pure king. And, uh, no, no, uh, yeah, okay, no. I mean, I mean, there, there, okay, that, that's something he's known. I mean, first of all, I mean, you would, I think you would, I should correct myself. I think we have started a little bit, but then uh, you quickly, quickly find, I mean, that you basically are frozen. I mean, the, the time scale, yeah, yeah, uh, that the time scale to, uh, at which anything happens is, is, is extremely long. So basically you have, I mean, it's consistent with the fact that the interpretation you have sort of insulating transport. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you.